This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ, Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth, according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. My family and I are very excited to be here today. We've been looking forward to this now for years, I guess you could say, and so we're glad this is finally a reality. We've been very interested in following uh, the things you've been doing here um, for a long time, and we're so excited for uh, what's going on here. I think there's so much potential for big things to happen here, a uh, great area that's growing and thriving, a great congregation, I think, with so much potential for big, big, big things. And so uh, we're excited for you. We're excited for what the future has in store. I see uh, the potential for tremendous, explosive growth, uh, and strengthen in numbers. So we're really excited to be here, uh, to meet you, to spend time with you, to check out the things that are going on here, and appreciate the, the invitation you've extended to us to be here. Um, it's good to see friends, uh, David and Shannon. Um, it was great to get to spend time and, and stay the night with Ben and Lana. Uh, ben was in my wedding uh, way back when. Um, we spent time together at David Minson's in a, a summer uh, several years ago, what David calls boot camp, and when you go through a boot camp with someone that tends to, to make you close and, and bring you together, and so uh, a lot of good memories, a lot of good time uh, spent together. My wife and I live in the Texas Panhandle in Canyon, Texas, just south of Amarillo, Texas, so we obviously, uh, fairly close to Lubbock, spent time with David and Shane and Ben and Lana uh, when they lived out there. There seems to be a migration uh, from the Texas Panhandle to Northwest Arkansas. So I'm wondering uh, when we will participate in that, uh, when our time will come. I am from uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, went to college there. Actually went to high school in Salisaw, Oklahoma, just across the state line. So I'm very familiar with the area, miss the area. Uh, you take so many things for granted from a scenery standpoint. Uh, when you grow up in green country and then uh, you appreciate those things even more when you live and move to brown country um, and I now live in the place where you can see the farthest which is cool but you can see the farthest and see the least um, so always enjoy coming back here uh, appreciate again the invitation not only to be here but also to study God's word with you we'll be studying from the book of Philippians if you want to turn there to the fourth chapter uh, this was a part of a series I've done at home and some other places on the book of Philippians with a special focus an emphasis on the subject of joy. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate how important joy is in our Christianity. We talk about the Christian disciplines of study, prayer, assembly, ministry, evangelism. But if we're not going to have joy, uh, we might as well not do everything else. We're not going to sustain everything else. Joy is critical to our Christianity. And this concept that we've had in the past, many Christians have had that smiling or showing any forms of happiness or joy was sinful and carnal. Uh, when we walk around like Eeyore, the joy of the Lord, that's not convincing. <laughs> that's not compelling. That's not attractive. And jo uh, joyless Christianity have done a great disservice to Christianity. Joyless Christians have done a great disservice to Christianity. Um, I've heard it described as joyless Christianity is the billboard of Satan. And so joy is so important. In fact, some would argue that the subject of joy, teaching on joy, the command to rejoice, which is not optional, it's a commandment, is as prevalent as any teaching in the entire Bible. In fact, 19 times in the book of Philippians alone, you'll find the concept of joy presented. Um, and so if you want real joy, if you want more joy, if you want lasting joy, I would encourage you to study and implement the book of Philippians into your life. It's a wonderful book. I thoroughly enjoyed studying the book of Philippians, have enjoyed presenting on the book of Philippians, and so uh, you can rejoice in the fact that we are not going to give that entire six-part series uh, in one session this morning. I'm going to give one part of that series, uh, and actually the very end of the series, in the second half, half of Philippians chapter 4, we want to talk about finding joy instead of uh, finding joy in all circumstances. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, second half, starting in verse 10. Um, Philippians 4, verse 4 is kind of the theme verse of the whole series. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Twice, 
within one verse, we're given the same command for emphasis because it's that important. It's that critical. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, uh, understand, note, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Joy is not optional for Christians. Now, it's optional in that we can choose happy. We can choose where and how we pursue happiness. But if we're going to be identified as a Christian, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The proof that we have the Spirit, the proof that we belong to Jesus is joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. And that word always is a huge convicting (laughs) word. You never have to be without joy in the Lord. Rejoice always. That's in the present active tense. Continually, habitually, always. Not just on a payday, not just on a holiday, not just on Sunday. If Monday is always bad, you will waste 10 to 15 years of your life. And do we understand and appreciate that joy, as the Bible presents it, has more to do with what's going on inside of you than what's going on all around you? Think about the misconceptions of the world. You know, we talk about happiness and joy. Is there a difference between happiness and joy? Well, if we think about happiness the way the world presents it, the way the world thinks of the pursuit of happiness, which often becomes a pursuit of selfish pleasure at the expense of your happiness and everyone else's happiness, but the word happiness, happenstance, the hap, chance. So we talk about happiness, a lot of times we're talking about that roller coaster of emotions, what side of the bed I got up on, that's up and down. We want to think about joy the way the Bible presents it as something deeper and richer and fuller than that, that roots us and grounds us and anchors us in something substantial and something that lasts no matter what's going on at the surface of our life. Rejoice in the Lord always. God used a man writing from prison to teach us about joy. I find that very interesting and ironic. This is a picture Kelsey and I took when in Rome uh, several years ago of Paul's alleged prison cell. And so what we see is we can be in prison physically, circumstantially, but somewhere entirely different emotionally and spiritually. Philippians chapter 4 beginning in verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, there were to be content. That's not where verse 10 is coming from. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Verse 19, But by God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. My happiness is not essentially dependent upon my circumstances, upon whether I'm hungry or whether I'm full. The ESV translates this, I have learned the secret. What secret have I learned that would produce this type of contentment and satisfaction? Well, when you look at the immediate context of the book of Philippians at large, what we would have covered previously in this series, some of the things we learned throughout the book of Philippians that allows us to learn the secret of contentment in all circumstances. Chapter 1, God turns loss into gain. Uh, Jesus saves. Suffering can be granted by God. Granted means it's a gift from God for the cause of Christ. Chapter 2, the lowest service is rewarded with the highest exaltation. Let this exaltation sustain you in the humbling. God is at work in us. Not grumbling, not complaining is a sign, is proof that you are a child of God, that you belong to Jesus. I can rejoice in life and in death Because to be with Christ is far better. Christ has made me His own. I love that statement Paul makes. Christ has made me His own. And He's redeemed my past, my present, and my future. Belly gods serving your stomach. Belly gods rob joy. Our citizenship is in heaven. Christ will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. Joy is in the Lord, not stuff. Philippians 4.4 Prayer plus gratitude results in the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And finally this morning, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's the immediate context. And as we zoom out to the remote context, we could consider so many verses and passages on the subject of joy 
and uh, with a special focus on contentment. We could look at many Proverbs, but I want to look at one passage from the Old Testament and one passage in the New Testament as we think about the total context, the remote context of the subject of contentment. One in the Old Testament, one in the New. First, uh, learning the secret of discontentment, the book of Ecclesiastes, the philosophy of life, the meaning of life, the purpose of life. Solomon writes here in Ecclesiastes 4, a wonderful passage. Uh, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. He said, I, basically the context of Ecclesiastes, I was seeking happiness, this pursuit of happiness and stuff. I got me this, I got me this, I got me this. I got built things, I bought things. I had women, 700 wives, 300. I sought happiness and pleasure, the life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. I sought it and all these things, and the conclusion was I was miserable. Vanity of vanities. I am miserable and depressed because happiness, real joy, is not found by direct selfish pursuit. In fact, that will make you unhappy. That will make you miserable. Happiness, joy, is found indirectly by directly pursuing God and other people. That's the secret. That's the truth. And so the richest, wealthiest man in the world wrote that, made that statement. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. The desire for more leads to more satisfaction. The myth is that having more will make me feel more secure, more loved, more happy. But the new car smell wears off. And if you have children, it wears off even faster. <laughs> How much does it take? That's the million dollar question. You ask poor people, you ask rich people, you ask millionaires, same universal answer, just a little more. We are addicted to upgrades. Sin entered the world because they had every fruit but one. And so it continues in verse 11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? The desire for more leads to more expenses. It costs more to have more. And when you have more, people that win the lottery, celebrities, people who are wealthy, you have more people coming into your life to help you spend it. And as you admire the green grass, the greener grass on the other side, as you admire the green grass, if the grass is greener, so is the water bill. <laughs> and if the grass is always greener on the other side, you need to get busy in your garden. Verse 12, sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. The desire for more leads to more anxiety and fatigue. It leads to less sleep, and research bears that out. The more you have, the less you sleep. And the irony is, we give up the first, we give up health in the first half of our life for more money, and then we give up all our money for more health in the second half of our life. <laughs> I never worry about my yacht, how to insure it, how to pay for it, where to store it, where to put it in West Texas. I never worry about my yacht. You know why I never worry about my yacht? Because I don't have a yacht. <laughs> and so it's not surprising. We're sick, we're tired, we're anxious, we're hurting. The ultimate result of the desire for more is more conflict. So you want to be free of all of this? You've got to learn the secret not only of discontentment, but we also have to learn the secret of contentment. 1 Timothy chapter 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. And it begs the question, is godliness without contentment even possible? And notice he doesn't say, don't live for gain. That's the misconception that we can't have any pleasure, any... Joy. He didn't say don't live for gain, but rather live for greater gain. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory talks about this concept that I thought was very profound that I hadn't thought of. We like to think sometimes that all desire is bad. Desire is sinful. Desire is bad. That's not always the case. And what he essentially says is when you consider the promises and the Gospels, the things Jesus taught about the reward of heaven, the joy of heaven, he said, it seems to me that our Savior finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. It's really not, that's really the problem. It's not that our desires are too strong, it's that our desires are too weak. He said, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with sex and money and drugs. Uh, and he goes on to say, in illustrated, it's like we're children at the beach, playing with our mud pies, content with our mud pies when a vacation at sea awaits us. He said, we are far too easily pleased. It's not that our desires are too strong, it's that our desires are too weak. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. There will not be a U-Haul chasing your hearse on the way to the cemetery. There won't be a luggage rack on top of your hearse. 
The only thing that you take with you is what you gave away in service to God and service to other people. That's the truth. The only thing you get to keep forever is your satisfaction, your contentment, your joy in Jesus. That's what you retain forever. And having food and clothing, let us therewith be content. Notice that Jesus defined, or Paul defines the necessities of life the way Jesus did in Matthew chapter 6. Food and clothing. Not necessarily a pantry, not necessarily a closet full of clothes. If you can cover and feed your body today, be grateful. Be content. And so the question becomes, has our attitude towards money and contentment been shaped by the Bible or by American consumerism? Because as Americans, we tend to define poverty as being without the luxuries of life. And you look at the statistics and research on poor people in America typically have a place to live, have a vehicle, have access to some of the best food, and clothing and technology in the history of the world, usually have a TV, <laughs> usually have a PlayStation. You know, we, we might be the only civilization in the history of the world whose poor people are obese. We eat well in America. And I'm not saying we shouldn't help people that are less fortunate than we are from an American standpoint. I'm, don't misunderstand. What I'm saying is what research bears out is that after the basic needs are met, after the food and clothing, the excess, the amenities really don't contribute to your joy. What money can't buy is what determines your joy. And so as the saying goes, contentment makes poor men rich. Discontentment makes rich men poor. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. This covetous desire for more that we talked about in the book of Ecclesiastes makes us vulnerable to get rich schemes. And it'll destroy not only your bank account, your business, your family, the church, your soul. What you do with your money can make or break your joy forever. And so he says in verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I've always wondered, why is the love of money the root of all evil? How is that? Why is that? How is it the root of all evil? All evils come from a certain type of heart, a certain type of mind or attitude, apparently the type of heart and attitude that loves and puts faith and trust in money. And if you love and put your faith and trust in money, Jesus says, Matthew 6, you will not love and put your faith and trust in God. And if you aren't loving, serving, trusting God, everything you do is evil. That's why it's the root of all evil. Love of money is a desire... That is a root of all types of desires, desires money can buy minus God. And all evil is desire minus God. It's not that our desires are too strong, it's that they are too weak. And so he says, but thou, man of God, flee these things, fall after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. Covetousness, like virtually all sin, is a battle of unbelief. Why are we investing in things outside of God, outside of the kingdom? Because we believe that we can receive a return on investment. We can receive what we're seeking outside of God. Faith says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Faith says, I have learned the secret. I have learned in whatsoever state I am there to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, Philippians chapter 3. And so he says, focus on Jesus. On the appearing of our Lord Jesus, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. We have something, someone greater to live for. So don't be rich with nothing. We talk a lot about people who have a lot to live on. Do they have anything to live for? And so that's the secret of discontentment and the secret of contentment. So what's my response to that? Now that I know the secret of contentment, how do I respond? Well, the response is stop coveting. Covetousness is desiring something so much that you lose contentment in God and start seeking it outside of God. That's why it's called idolatry in places like Colossians chapter 3. In fact, the Ten Commandments are bookended, the first and last. No other gods thou shalt not covet. Stop coveting, stop comparing. That's why you're coveting. It's the result. 
Coveting is the result of comparison. It's the source of insecurity and inferiority complexes. And insecure people are not happy. What do we do when we see something that we like that's not ours? Nice house. Nice car. Nice clothes. Nice hair. That's why you're frustrated. (laughs) This contentment is a multi-billion dollar industry. And if you haven't learned this secret, the goal of advertising is to get you to be discontent in life. And so we've got to learn how to be content with what we have in Christ. I'm not saying satisf- not growing. Paul talks about Philippians 3, I press on. We're not talking about being satisfied in that, but content with what we have in Jesus. And be- learn to be happy for people. You know what I do when I see something I like that I didn't pay for, it's not mine? And somewhat it's my nature as a saver, as my wife would say cheap, I prefer frugal. When I see something I like that's expensive, you know what I think? I'm thankful I didn't pay for that. I'm thankful I don't have those payments. I'm thankful I don't have to insure that. I can admire without the need to acquire the yacht. As Shakespeare said, happiness is not having what you want, it's wanting what you have. Stop coveting, stop comparing, stop complaining. Having gone to a third world country, gone to India several times, Ben has made that trip. You know, some of the things I appreciate now that I didn't really appreciate before, hot water, ice for drinks, nice smells. You really appreciate that in India. Regulations to a certain extent, to a certain limit, but there are some safety standards that do not exist in traffic. (laughs) And you see kids that have been electrocuted because they have lines run at the ground level. you're so thankful, and you come back, and for a few months, it's like, I'm not going to complain. I am not, and then a few months later, you revert back to being an American. The median annual salary in the world is just over $1,000. If your household income is $26,000 or more, you're in the top 10% richest people in the world. If your household income is $52,000 or more, you're in the top 1%. Like over half the richest 1%, 10% people in the world are in America. And it's hard to complain when you're grateful. Hard to complain when you're grateful. I've enjoyed hospitality in places like this. This is my first trip to India. We enjoyed hospitality and joy in that home. (laughs) Gone to orphanages of orphans that we support. And they are overjoyed to show you their suitcase, which contains everything they own. Every item of clothing, every toy, every book. So as the saying goes, I once complained that I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And it's interesting when you look at Paul's thank you note to the Philippians for the gift, the financial support. They, it's kind of an interesting thank you note, you know. Thanks for the gift. It finally got here. <laughs> Been waiting for a while. But, but, but he goes, I just, he said, you know, uh, you just lacked opportunity. You just haven't had a chance to send it yet. Thanks for the gift, but I don't really need it. I'm God supplied. I can do all things to Christ who strengtheneth me. Paul refused to live in a prison of of resentment. That's the worst prison of all. How do you choose to interpret your situation? Do you see the providence in it? Joseph said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it, used it for good. Recognize the Epaphroditus standing right in front of you. We can live in resentment or we can live in contentment. And so once I know the secret of discontentment and contentment, I now know how to be abased. I know how to hunger. I know how to suffer. I can do all things through Christ includes not only the abounding things, not only the winning things, it includes the losing things, the abasing things. I can lose through Him who strengthens me. You don't see that many locker rooms. Appreciate all the seasons. He said, your care for me hath flourished. It's blossomed. Essentially saying, I made it through winter. I made it to spring. I made it through winter when the nights were long, the days were short. Don't get stuck in winter. Don't get stuck in resentment, in bitterness. If you focus on the negative 30 degree wind chills we have back in February, you'll be a negative, cold, empty person. The one who wrote this suffered and hungered tremendously. In fact, we have somewhat of a catalog of some of this suffering in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in the very next chapter is where he talks about his thorn in the flesh. This is a passage that has become so precious to me 
um, so many principles, so many lessons and series that can be preached just from these verses. The power of a thorn, the value of a thorn. I preached on this at home a few months ago, <laughs> and a couple weeks later, I got mine. I got one. Uh, it kind of makes you gun shy as a preacher. You preach about something, and we need to appreciate the value of a thorn, and then you get the, an opportunity to practice what you preach. What was the thorn? That's the question we want to, right? What was his thorn? Well, I can tell you what the thorn was not. He wasn't saying the power of Christ is magnified in my bad choices. It wasn't self-inflicted. You look at the context of 2 Corinthians, he's facing opposition from false teachers who are preaching out of false motives, trying to turn the church at Corinth that he had established and risked so much for against him. This was perhaps the lowest part of his life the lowest point in his ministry. He's being forced to do something he finds very awkward. He's having to defend his apostleship. And how does he do that? Absolutely brilliant. Not by drawing attention and glory to himself, but you know what he does to defend his apostleship? He draws attention to his thorn in the flesh. Not to his strengths. He draws attention to his weaknesses. And the point is, if I've endured all these things, chapter 11, I've endured all these things, I've accomplished all these things in my ministry. The only way you can explain this is by the power of God. By the fact that I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so the thorn in the flesh could have been these false teachers, that he was this opposition that he was experiencing. It could be the mental, emotional, physical trauma that he had experienced that we read in the previous chapter. Some think it might have been eye problems. He writes to the Galatians about... His eye, and you would have plucked out your eyes and gave them to me if you could have. But I think there is a blessing in the fact, the truth is we don't know what a thorn in the flesh was. We can't say with absolute certainty what it was. And the blessing in that is no matter what your thorn in the flesh is, what adversity you're experiencing, what opposition you're experiencing, what challenges you're experiencing, we can relate to, we can sympathize with, we can learn and apply the lessons of the value and power of a thorn. And perhaps my favorite one of all is the very first verse in this passage, verse 7. So, here's why. So means, here's the transition into why I have this thorn in the flesh. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that he was receiving as an apostle, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. It's bookended. One verse bookended with the same exact explanation. The thorn of the flesh was to keep me from becoming conceited. And don't miss this fact. This is a wonderful principle and concept. To keep me from being conceited is not the work of Satan. Satan works to do the opposite of that. That's the work of God. God uses Satan against Satan. God will use the father of lies and pride to deliver us from lies and pride. Satan wanted to use this thorn to turn Paul away from his ministry and to self-exaltation. God took it and he used it to turn him away from self-exaltation to humble him and turn him back to his ministry. And evidently, God thinks my humility is more important than my comfort and my freedom from pain. Thorns are blessings to protect our faith, our hope, our love, our joy from being destroyed by our pride. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Value of thorns, it draws us closer to God, into God's grace, into God's comfort, which is some of the greatest joy you'll ever experience in life. And you don't get that comfort without reasons to need comforting. That's the paradox. And if you've ever experienced these thorns, if you've ever awaited medical results, loss of a loved one, adversity in your life, if you let it, you understand the profound impact it can have on you spiritually as a person, on your joy. In particular, how it can affect your prayer life. Not only the quantity, but the quality of your prayer life. I pleaded with the Lord. But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God responded. God answers the prayer. Sometimes the answer is no. Talk about unanswered prayers. There are no unanswered prayers for child of, children of God. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it's maybe later. God responded not by decreasing the pain in the circumstance, but by increasing the grace to increase the trust and the assurance 
He doesn't promise us exemption from troubles. He doesn't promise us a trouble-free life. In fact, we're promised the opposite of that, but He does promise sufficient grace. Not always in the form that we ask for, but again, it begs the question, without these thorns, could we really experience and know that God's grace is sufficient for me? That His power is perfected in my weakness. When I have nothing left, nothing to offer, if I'm sufficient in myself, I get the glory. And so God uses us not just in spite of our weakness, but because of our weakness to show His power and His glory for the sake of Christ. That's, what, that's the purpose for everything. That's the reason for everything. To the glory of God. Paul said in Philippians 1, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. If those in Caesar's palace know that my imprisonment is for Christ, brethren are emboldened to speak up without fear. He said everything's going according to plan. <laughs> Sitting in prison in Rome, this is all working out. I'm happy. I'm rejoicing. I might be incarcerated, but the gospel is not incarcerated. And I will rejoice. My suffering, my thorn in the flesh, this adversity, this opposition has given the gospel an audience it would not have had otherwise. And I will rejoice so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God is weakening you so you'll be as strong as possible by being as full of the grace of God as possible. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. And Paul says in verse chapter 1 and chapter 3, what does kill me makes me far better. Temporary pain can protect us from permanent pain. We understand that medically with our children. The ultimate example of that to deliver us from evil pain and suffering, Christ experienced the greatest evil pain and suffering of all time. He wore a crown of thorns for us. That's the value of a thorn. Now I'm not trusting in my resources, my ingenuity, my plans, and it's then that I begin to see the power of God released in my weakness. In the midst of my suffering and thorn in the flesh, I find my real power source. And here's the secret. The more aware you are of God's grace, the more humble, prayerful, grateful, and as a result, joyful you'll be. And so notice his response. This is absolutely phenomenal. Therefore, here's the response. Here's how I'm going to respond. Here's how I'm going to interpret my situation. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. My grace is sufficient. Same word for content, 1 Timothy 6. Same word, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased at the Lord's baptism. It doesn't get any more content, any more satisfied than that. If I can have this ministry, these revelations to be humbled and protected against pride through this thorn, which also exposes and defeats Satan and his lies and magnifies Christ and his glory for Christ's sake, I will rejoice. I am content. I am well pleased. Magnifying Christ was what he lived for. That's, how, that's what determined every response to every circumstance. I will magnify Christ in my life. I will magnify Christ in my death. Paul says in chapter 1, in my thorn, in my handicap, in my hospital bed, even if my hospital bed becomes my deathbed. He went from sorrow to joy. I've learned the secret. I understand now. I get it. I embrace it. I want to tell you one of the biggest questions to be answered in your life that will determine the tone that's set in your life, the eternal destiny of your life. When God gives you a thorn for these reasons, to accomplish these purposes, how are you going to respond? Like the world murmuring, complaining, accusing, or like that? So I know now how to be abased. I know how to abound. I know not only how to lose, I know how to win now. What's the, what are the secrets I've learned on how to win? In the immediate context of the book of Philippians, chapter 1, admit that you aren't deserving and appreciate the grace. Give thanks. There's a strong correlation between gratitude and joy. We see that throughout the book of Philippians. Talk a lot about that in the series. You want to be happy? Be grateful. Be thankful. Because hate and bitterness cannot coexist in a heart of gratitude. It's hard to be hateful when you're grateful. To be anxious when you're gracious. Remember that abundance can become lost at any moment. Remember the surpassing worth of knowing Christ and that the abundance is dung, rubbish, 
trash by comparison, and even if it was all taken away, my joy, my contentment, my peace in Christ will remain forever. That's what I get to keep. Our contentment is threatened not just by bad times, it's threatened by good times. We talk about people sometimes, you'll hear coaches talk about athletes or teachers about students. They just don't know how to handle success. And I think that's the indictment maybe for us as Christians living in America. Not just that we don't know how to suffer, we don't do that a lot maybe, but we don't know how to abound. We haven't learned how to win. So going back to the remote context as we zoom out back to 1 Timothy 6, charge them that are rich in this world, and if you haven't learned the secret, that's us. <laughs> But they do what? They be not high-minded, nor trust an uncertain rich and living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Don't flaunt it. Don't show it off. It's easy to believe that we are more because we have more. Don't do that. And notice that God wants us not only to endure, but He also wants us to enjoy. We talked about that earlier. It's not that our desires are too strong. It's that they are too weak. There's a sense in which God wants us to enjoy blessings, the blessed life, the best life. Think about the aesthetic argument for God's existence as it fits within the intelligent design argument that essentially beauty exists. That's a reality. The ability to perceive and appreciate beauty is a reality experienced even by unbelievers because of the providence of God. Beauty exists and it cannot be explained by natural selection or the theory of evolution. The only explanation is we serve a beautiful God who creates beautiful things in us and for us, for our enjoyment even. God created us with taste buds and gave us Brahms. Created us with ears and gave us music. Created us with eyes and gave us color. Color serves no purpose. They do good, they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. The antidote to materialism is giving. If you're holding on too tight, you've got to start letting go. The poor need you to give. The church needs you to give. You need you to give. And we need to learn to be content with the necessities, with the food and clothing so that we can invest the excess in what really matters, what we really keep with us and take with us. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And so Paul says in verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Notice what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. This is something I cover in part one. We start with what Jesus taught on the keys, the paradoxical keys to blessedness, to happiness, to the blessed life. And as you go through the qualities, the characteristics, the type of person that's going to be happy, he describes, he gives descriptions of dispositions and then a declaration of blessing or a promise. So it's, God wants us to be happy. Sometimes we react to that because of the world's concept of doing what makes you happy at the expense of everyone else's happiness through sin and selfish direct pursuit that makes us miserable. But there's a sense in which God wants us to be happy. God wants to bless us. God wants us to live a blessed life. But we have to have the attitudes and the actions that are going to be blessed by God. And so the last quality he talks about, Blessed are you, and men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Luke 10, they said, look at all these things we're accomplishing in our ministry. And he said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Neither suffering or success can destroy our joy because Jesus has anchored both in the reward of heaven. And notice Philippians 4, 19, Paul says, I have this can-do attitude. Because I've learned the secret. I've learned the source of my strength, of joy that lasts. God's will and His ability uh, accords uh, with His riches. That's the quantity. In glory is the quality beyond earthly. By Christ is the source, the guarantee. And so seeking this contentment in God is for our good and ultimately for God's glory. We proclaim to a discontent, unsatisfied, starving world that only Christ can truly satisfy that no circumstance can extinguish joy in Jesus, that joy doesn't just come when the clouds lift and the storm passes, but it's found in the storm, in the eye of the storm, through the storm. If you rejoice in the Lord, you never have to be without real joy ever again for another day in your life. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's the gospel truth. 
Never settle for a God who can't provide joy in any and every circumstance. And if you're here and you're seeking that joy, it's found in Christ alone. If you want joy that lasts, both you and the source of your joy have to be eternal. If either one aren't, you have a joy that won't last. The only place you'll find that joy is in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, Beatitudes. The type of people that will be in the kingdom of heaven. Believe, repent, be born again, baptized in the kingdom. Maybe you're here as a Christian. Maybe you've learned the secret of discontentment and contentment. Maybe you need to apply that secret. And find joy in any and every circumstance. A joy that anchors you and grounds you and roots you no matter what's going on at the surface of your life. If we can pray for you or help you, if you have a spiritual need, the Lord invites you to come. Have a seat on the front as we stand and sing together. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.